This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. way to start our sunrise safari with old Dewey, our resident male hippo that's just uh, enjoying a treehouse dam and just uh, relaxing here in the water for the morning. But it is quite a cool morning. We've, I've got my jacket on and I'm sure Dewey is enjoying that uh, water area. Yeah, Juma Private Game Reserve in Sabi Sands. Good morning everybody. My name is Cedric Dold and behind the camera here yeah, on Sparky I've got Olof. So yes. Thank you, thank you for joining us. It is a very cloudy morning, as you can see. I did have my, I've still got my jacket on, and it is quite fresh. But uh, I'm hoping that it's going to be a fantastic uh, sunrise uh, safari. Well, yesterday we had an amazing sunset safari, so I'm sure. So today is going to be just as good. But yes, as you can see, it is a live, it is an interactive show. So if you've got any comments, questions, or any suggestions that you want to send through to us, please do so. Of course, we all are waiting for all those amazing questions from you. Keeps us on our toes as well. But this morning, out on drive, we've got on Rusty of James and Paul. And then Pridelands, we've got Rex and Owen. And further up in the northwest at Madikwe, we've got Steve and Rian. And of course, all the way down at Kericha, we've got Nick that's going to be joining us as well on our sunrise safari. But all for us here at Juma at the moment, it's not our sunrise, it's more of a, a rise safari. X Ranger, good morning. Thank you once again for joining us. Yes, I'm glad you're having a nice chill day and definitely it is going to be a fantastic bumble. I am at Treehouse Dam. I'm just going to be combing through this area, the southern side of Juma for the morning, just to see what's happening here because yesterday afternoon we were pretty much all in the north, northern side of the property because everything was happening in the northern side. Leopards, lions, wild dogs. So I'm going to do a little bit of a, a scratch around here on the southern side and see if we are lucky with anything around here. But yes, it is a lovely pleasant day. As I said, this is the first time I'm wearing a jacket for the summer. It's, it's very, very strange, but it's fine. I think a good old coolish day is definitely welcoming. But yeah, well, we're going to just sit here at Treehouse Dam and listen out for anything around this side. Let's head over to James, as he wants to say good morning to everybody. Hello, good morning. Yes, it is a good day here in the low felt of South Africa. Mm -hmm. We have started off with a hyena no less, at the kill site where Cara the leopardess was yesterday, then there were the wild dogs, then there were the lions, and now there is a hyena. My name is James Hendry. On camera today we have Gordon Paul. Do you struggle waking up this morning, Paul? Yeah. <laughs> Slight uh, struggle with waking up this morning, but we're all coffeeed up and ready to go on this rather cloudy morning here in the western fringes of the Greater Kruger National Park. Please send us any of your questions, comments, jokes, insults, general bonhomie. It's always nice to hear from you. I don't know who this hyena is. I'm sure one of you will let us know. And he, she, I think it's a she, managed to find herself some bones, some last remaining bones, which amazes me from the kill yesterday I would have thought that there was nothing left and if you were not with us yesterday what happened was that we had a leopardess uh, this is 
Ntima the ha the ha <laughs> This is Ntima the hyena. Thank you very much to those of you who recognised her. Um, yesterday, Clara the leopardess killed an impala here. She stashed it in one of these trees. Uh, in the morning, the wild dogs came by, and then in the afternoon. Kara was eating her impala, she went off for a drink, the wild dogs returned, finished the kill, and then the lions heard the wild dogs, and they came rushing in, and there was a great deal of consternation and barking and uh, general uh, disquiet out here in the wilderness. And finally, it all quietened down, so we just come, we thought we'd come and see what was going on in this part of the world. We found a whole lot of impalas, and Ntima the hyena. We were laughing quietly to ourselves and Paul and I because we thought how amusing it must have been when the hyenas finally woke up to the fact that there was some action going on here and they must have been deeply put out in the evening when they pitched up and there was nothing going on here but the smell of conflict and tracks of lions and dogs and leopards all over the place. <laughs> Leopard lover says happy Australian day. She wants to know how how good my my Australian accent is. I think people who people who weren't Australian would probably think it's not too bad, but I think that Australians would think it was terrible. So my Australian accent is a uh, is based largely on listening to cricket and rugby players in post-match interviews and uh, so maybe we should talk about these uh, these Impala here in our bad Australian accent. I think I probably get it right every so often but I think I can hear that here I'm not getting it right all the time. So happy Australia Day to all of those living in Australia it's a, I'm sure it's a lovely day wherever you are. I hope it's a lovely day wherever you are in Australia. Summer in Australia, for those of you who don't know, it's a similar latitude to, to where we are now. Well, northern parts of Australia, similar latitude to where we are now. Of course, Australia is a, I don't know if you know, knew this or not, is one of the most nutrient poor continents on the planet. Indeed, the vast majority of the interior is a barren desert. And one of the most interesting parts about that fact is that everything in Australia, except the human beings, of course, hops. Why would you think that they hop? Well, apparently, hopping is a really efficient way to move energetically speaking and if you live in a place that's got no nutrients well then hopping is a great way to get around so that is why in Australia everything hops okay I think we'll dispense with this and go back to normal <laughs> these impala don't seem to mind too much. Hello, Tim. You say you're so excited for my storytelling on this drive. Well, I hope I find something that I can tell you a story about. These impala don't seem to be particularly put out by the fact that one of their cousins, brothers, or sisters actually, died here yesterday. There doesn't seem to be a period of mourning. Nobody is wearing a black armband. There is no flag flying at half-mast. They're all just back in the same place they were yesterday when one of their number was mercilessly clawed and toothed down by Clara the Leopardess. Perhaps there are one or two in there who are shedding the odd tear, wondering where Betty is and why she hasn't returned to have a graze with them. Anyone seen Betty? No, last I saw she was heading into that thicket yesterday morning. Oh. <laughs> and 
poor old Betty is now passing through the elementary canals of a leopard, six wild dogs, and one fat male lion. Oh, and that hyena. Now, let us also go across to the wilden beast that is over yonder side. My timing there was absolutely appalling because the impala set up a fearful ruckus as there seems to be some kind of rutting behavior going on. And I think this is a function of this secondary birthing season. Some of the ewes are going to give birth now. I saw a newborn the other day. And then we'll get into the kind of slow build-up towards the main rut in April and May. This wildebeest is also unconcerned by the demise of Betty the Impala yesterday. He thinks there are quite enough of them, and the demise of one is going to sate the predators to a certain extent, and, well, her disappearance hasn't exactly reduced the number of eyes that he is using in the Impala to help him survive. There seems to be a bit of a myth that I've now read three or four times that wildebeest have very poor eyes, but they've got good ears and a sense of smell, and that's why they hang out with zebra. I think that that's garbage. I don't know why anybody should say wildebeest have poor eyes. I'm sure they're pretty good. It doesn't make any sense that they should have poor eyes. Perhaps I'm wrong. Right, Rexon Ntimane, the inimitable, uh, the uh, skilled, the magnificent, is 50 kilometers away to the west, and he would like to say hello. Good morning, good morning everyone. Uh, we are really moving to the north of the Nshofu uh, Dam, and we're having a young male lion. Right in front of us, uh, look at uh, him, he's really moving so slow. I hope he might try to get uh, the rest of the pride. From myself, Rexon, this morning, and Owen behind the camera, we're looking for a great uh, morning. Would like to stay with this particular young male and see where he might take us to. Let's see if we can manage to stay with him. It's very thick here. Slowly by shore. He's moving in a very thick block. Right in the front there. Alana, great for your comment. We have this uh, beautiful young male moving and calling all the time, trying to relocate the members of the um, pride itself. He might be so much vulnerable. Listen. He's time and again calling. It's nice to get the sound of a line trying to relocate members of the pride itself. He's so much vulnerable. As he's calling, maybe you never know what might be in the area. It could be other pride that gets in, but normally in Pride Land, we only have Ngati Pride. But uh, it can happen that uh, new male gets into the area. As he calls, they might be able to hear him from the distance and respond, being silent, and come to the area. He might uh, get killed easy on that way. Being lonely, it's a highly risk.
Mashatu Game Reserve has a glowing reputation as one of the most beautiful reserves in Southern Africa. And now, atop a soaring cliff overlooking the Majale River beneath the groves of Euphorbia succulents sits the stunning new Mashatu Euphorbia Villas. These eco-friendly villas echo their beautiful natural surroundings shaped to match the Mapanu parts of Mashatu. Enjoy earthy glamour with a consciousness for conservation woven into every element of these camps within the 32,000 hectare reserve. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to the dawn. Welcome to Medique. Hello, everybody. My name is Steve, and I'm joined by Rion and camera, and we are out and about in a nice, cool morning here in Medique. It's nice to be on the Sunrise Safari, and we are very excited to be out and about and to see what we can find. Now, we had a male lion around the airstrip last night, and Cheeky Boy has gone away. I mean, how dare he leave? What does he think he's doing? Anyway, we're trying to find out where he might have gotten to. You know, he, no doubt he walked on the airstrip. So, after walking on the airstrip, where did he go? It's a long airstrip to check. So we've checked the other side. We've now come down onto the southern side, or should I say the eastern side, to see if maybe some tracks have come here. Good chance. He went towards the quarry that side or to Twasa water this side. So this is our next best bet to check. We did follow up on some guinea fowl alarm calling in the block just before, but uh, that led us nowhere. I think they were just admiring the sunrise. Oh, here we go. Here is a track. Going straight across here towards the airstrip and towards Twasa. So, will we be lucky? That looks like a female though. But um, it's a beautiful morning out here. Beautiful morning. It's nice to be out in the dawn. Oh, Sherry, it's going to be a rocker. I don't know how we can compete with what James and Cedric put on the cards yesterday, but, <coughs> excuse me, we are going to attempt. We are going to surely attempt to. <laughs> so here we are on the famous airstrip. At least one track of a lioness has come straight through there. There's a nice little link road here that takes us to 
<coughs> Excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. Access to the watering point. And the river, the Groot Mariko River. Ah, oh, but what we have though at the moment is, is the dawn. And I hope that that is going to work. sunrise here next to the terminal building on the airstrip. It's always nice to switch off and watch the sunrise, not only because it's beautiful, but it's a moment to sit and listen to what's going on in the wilderness. Opportunity to listen for the alarm calls. <coughs> Opportunity to clear one's throat. Hmm. I invite you, if you're all sitting there, to just relax, to take a deep breath. trouble well you know I love hugging a tree trees are so rooted and so grounded I thoroughly enjoy spending time with the sentient beings of trees Mm, and the very beautiful peach the apricot sky it is a gorgeous morning and I hear zebra's alarm calling in the direction we want to go so let's start up our engines and let's go see what the dawn presents listening for alarm calls nice opportunity when you sit to watch the sunrise you can hear the animals shouting Something like that. My attempt at a zebra. Not a great attempt. But we followed our a couple of our lions a few times straight from that terminal building along this pathway towards the watering hole.
does open up a bit so they often walk through they don't necessarily keep to the road here Yeah, well, we're going to see if we can pick up on some more tracks, maybe even an animal. In the meantime, back over to Mr. James Hendry down in Juma. Mr. James says good day again. We're going to have a plant segment now, a little obligatory plant segment. We have found no tracks of any kind of interesting animal. Now, I don't want you to tell anybody what I'm going to do here because I'm actually going to trespass. I'm now trespassing. Don't tell anyone, see? Oh dear, it's now started to rain. Uh, sorry, we're going to have to cover everything up quickly. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, oh no. <laughs> that, that, uh, that came upon us rather quickly. I was going to do a segment on Venonia. <laughs> All right, let's go across to Kericha where I don't think it's raining. Good morning from Kariha here in the Eastern Cape where it promises to be an absolute cooker of a day today. I'm Nick, I'm going to be your photographic naturalist for today. And you can see we're down here on the, the open plains, the sun is out. There's, uh, there was obviously no cloud cover last night, lots of dew on the ground and I think it is definitely going to be a very, very warm day today. So we have had uh, a cooler day or two over the past uh, sort of two, three days. Still relatively cool now, but uh, I would say in the next hour and a half, it promises to start warming up very quickly. And we've got uh, a nice little Blessbrook mother and her youngster here. This, this little youngster's uh, had quite a lot of antics going on this morning. He's been charging all over the place. Then he stops and he's been, he's been like dunking his head in the bushes. <laughs> and he's just, uh, he's just taken a little, little halftime break. And I'm hoping he's going to continue to to do his thing for us. But let's wait and see. So we're here close to Scotia Dam, just a little bit further east. So if you have a look at the, that little youngster on the left hand side, I'm not too sure if you can see that game trail weaving across diagonally. So that's one of the several game trails in the area that kind of lead down to, to Scotia Dam. Remember a lot of these game trails will be the path of, of least resistance for a lot of the animals. Uh, quite often we see when the buffalo come from the eastern side of of uh, the thickets by Scotia Dam, this is one of the game trails that they love to use. Now, little Blessbrook calf taking it easy for the moment. I feel like it's Murphy's Law. Every time I see some type of antelope youngster running around and 
you know, really being jovial with life. Position the vehicle up. Think about where the sun is. Try and get a beautiful shot. You know, hoping that he doesn't run away. And then an instance like this where he just stops his antics altogether. But that is the bush for you, I guess. See, we've got some of our zebras here as well. Shame it potentially looks like this uh, this zebra fall. From this angle, it looks like his um, his fur is a little bit wet there. Remember, with uh, all of the dew that we've got here, that's not surprising. So I'm sure he'll do a little bit of grooming throughout the morning. Maybe mom will give him a, a little bit of a helping hand as well. But even from this distance here, you can see that, uh, especially if you look at that hair on his, on his back legs there, on his rump, how it's not really smooth against his body. There we go, he's doing a little bit of grooming and cleaning there. I'm sure he doesn't enjoy it, but it's got to be done at some point in time. <laughs> he is staring in the direction of the sun thinking about something good looked like there was a little bit of movement on the ground there I don't know if you saw that potentially a little bird or something maybe a little oxpecker that was just in front of his feet behind him looks potentially like a lapwing even Yes, well, 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 guess we, we just bumped into here on uh, one of our roads called the Twin Dams. And uh, yes, we bumped into a pride of lions. Looks like the Talamati breakaways. But yes, if you just joined us on our sunrise safari, welcome and a very good morning to everybody. And uh, yes, it's been quite a quite an exciting start to the Sunrise Safari. Or Rex in there in Pridelands has, uh, well, he had a, a young male a lion that was busy calling for the rest of the pride. And uh, James had a single hyena that was pretty much at the same uh, kill site where Cara had a impala kill yesterday afternoon. And uh, for myself here, yeah, I've got uh, the Talamati breakaways fast asleep. But good morning, everybody. My name is Cedric Dold, and I'm going to be the naturalist here on Sparky this morning with, of course, Ulof as my cam op. So I'm hoping that we are going to have some great sightings further on from here. And uh, as you can see, it is alive. It is an interactive show. So if you've got any questions or comments, suggestions, something that you want to see, please let us know. Send it through. And I'm hoping that we can answer any questions or get whatever character you are looking for but yeah telemati breakaways fast asleep looks like they've had a rough night definitely a rough night because there is not even there's no heads that's uh, up all of them are flat cats russell good morning yes uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's your favorite wild cats, but yes, Russell, they are absolutely gorgeous, and especially this uh, this pride that we've got now, the Talamati breakaways. Uh, it's three females and the five uh, youngsters, the one-year-old youngsters that's uh, in this pride. I don't see the dominant male. He's usually the, the, or the S8 male, or slash in barley male, and he's usually with this pride, but I don't see him here at all. He might be lying in the back end because we just bumped into them as we were heading towards Gauri Dam. And uh, yeah, they are definitely not active at all. It seems like their bellies is a little bit full, so I'm sure they had something to feed on during the night time. I don't think something too substantial. <laughs> well, we are going to sit with the Talamati breakaways. Let's head over to Steve in Madikwe. Apparently, he's also got some amazing cat luck.
Mm, well, welcome to Madikwe and welcome to this beautiful lioness that we've managed to find. Tracks always give us such a great idea of where to look. Even if you can't always follow them directly, it gives you an idea. And then those alarm calls of the zebras put us in the right spot. So she called just a moment ago. Sorry, I'm just going to communicate on the radio. Stand by. You're most welcome. Um, did you get the location? Yeah, affirmative. Just north of the road, you'll be third. Okay, so as with most reserves, there's a three vehicle um, sighting, depending on the position. You know, some some sightings you might limit to two, you might even limit to one, depending on the accessibility and the sensitivity. And that's generally the guide in child's prerogative to make that decision. Say, for example, you could only really see it with one car because of just the way it is. Then you can't have three vehicles trying to mission in there. So this is definitely space for three at least. And, uh, yeah, well, we were going to do a segment and then call it in. And then she called for us. And then everybody was trying to follow up on a lioness calling. So we called it in. But we weren't going to keep it to ourselves for very long. We we're going to keep it to ourselves for just one segment. But Because as soon as a lion gets found, it, the radio suddenly gets busy. But what's nice is that the guys here take over the radio immediately as they get here. Ha, <laughs> Kabuki, it's Thursday, fur day. Thursday, Thursday. That's a very good one. That's a good one, Kabuki. That is a good one indeed. Feline Thursday. Isn't she pretty? Now, she's been lying down in the, the red earth. Her whole, whole left side of, right side of her face is quite red. The ear and the shoulder. I thought maybe she was covered in blood. But having a look closely it shows that she's just been enjoying a bit of a, a, bit of a nap. She is a powerful female. Oh, she's got a whole lot of ticks in her ear. Now, I don't really know many of the differences here. You know, there's obviously a few lionesses with collars, but there's one female that moves around that apparently is kind of a bit of a loner. I think we've had her once before, and she wasn't very relaxed. But um, this is one of the, this is the big girl. And she's very stately, as um, Rian said, giving us her perfect sphinx pose. The perfect sphinx pose. Okay, so I'm going to turn my radio off now, as one of the other Mythico vehicles has arrived. Good morning. So those of you who know me, you know that we love to find tracks in the morning and we get very excited when we track animals down and find them. So 50, that's a good question. Um, dogs don't play with the prey. They just eat it, <laughs> if you've ever seen a dog. And dogs do play with toys. Um, dogs will worry things to kill it. But it's not play. Cats, as a learning curve, will play. So yes, I can't think of another, another predator that does play with their food. I mean, domestic cats, cheetah, leopard, lion, especially the youngsters. The adults don't play. The adults just kill it. But it's a very important learning curve for youngsters to to be given live prey and to 
to play with it until they learn how to kill it. It's, I know it sounds quite rough, but, um, you know, I've had uh, domestic cats who've been very good at bringing food into the house, but they haven't really known what to do with it. And then you're always having to remove zebra's alarm calling further north now. You're always having to remove these these terrified animals, lizards and mice and the like. So I can't think of another animal that does, another species or genre, genre of animals that play with their food, apart from maybe teenagers or children. <laughs> the animal kingdom food is pretty sacred and they eat it. If they don't eat it, they're not hungry. Like lions will play with tortoises, mainly as a means of getting in. But it's a good question. I don't, I don't know if there's another species or another grouping that plays with their food. Not that I can think of. It might be a question to ask the audience as well as maybe the other naturalists on drive this morning if they know of other animals that play with their food. Birds generally just eat. And if what looks like play... It's actually the, the, the need to kill, to dismember, or to break up the prey animal. I wouldn't necessarily call it play. But cats are so instinctive, they know how to catch. But it's that... The zebras are going crazy up here. She might be waiting for them to come running here. So we're going to stay with her because, well... What else are we going to do this morning? And in the meantime, let's, you know, let's just see what she gets up to. Here at Wild Earth, we take great pride in curating our best animal content for you. Would you like our very best animal stories, highlights, questions, and the inside scoop on all things Wild Earth before anyone else? Find it all, as well as info on our exciting plans going forward first, in the newsletter Handmade Just For You. Available to all Wild Earth explorers. Right, so we are still sitting here with the Telemati breakaways. As you can see, flat, flat, flat cat at the moment. This typical weather, we have been having a little bit of drizzle that's been coming through now. It is quite cool. 
And I think uh, the Tanamati Breakways and these five youngsters are definitely not going to be moving too much for now. Um, but the S8 male is here. Um, we can't see him, but the S8 male is just uh, behind all these quarry bushes that's in front of us. Uh, fortunately, we cannot move at this point in time. But we will try and reposition very soon to see if we can get to see him. So yes, it is nice to see them. But yeah, typical, you know, like if you think about your cats and your dogs at home and it's a cold day and they're feeling all very kind of uh, chilly, always going to lie down and, you know, curl up and try and keep warm. So this is exactly what they are doing now. The tummies are full and they are definitely very, very relaxed for the morning. And I don't think they're going to move much with this kind of weather. Nina, yawn while eating, like, I'm trying to figure this one out, yawn while eating. Look, they can be eating and maybe swallow whatever they're eating, and then maybe yawn after that, yes. But I don't think while they're busy chewing on meat and busy cutting through uh, the hide and all that, that they'll, they'll yawn at the same time, because if that happens, I don't know, I don't think they'll be able to swallow the meat. So, maybe like, you know, while they're eating and swallow and like rest, and then maybe yawn a bit and... You know, yeah, that could happen, but I don't think... Oh, here he comes, here he comes, here he comes, here he comes. There he is, there's the S8 male. There's the big boy. Ooh. Oh, hello. Look at that. Look at that. I'm a zing zing. I always think this is such a beautiful male. I don't know. I think he's stunning. That beautiful, he's got a real golden... Mane with a real dark kind of back end of the mane. Oh, look at that. Very proud male. And he's in good, good condition. Absolutely good condition. I think he's going to take cover under one of those quarries. Yep, he's going to go straight under the quarry. And I'm sure he's going to go and, and lie down there. Yep, there it is, flat. There it is. So as I said, it is drizzling a little bit, so you'll find sometimes the lions will actually, if it's raining or drizzling, and you know they're not out on hunting and that, they'll try and rather find some shelter somewhere. We've got a little one that's got its head up on the right hand side here. So he's just, <laughs> oh, he had his head up. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think they rather want to sleep. It feels like me. <laughs> But from where they were last night, um, where they stole the kill from those wild dogs to where they are now, uh, give and take maybe a good two kilometers. Waikisha, yes, definitely. It's, it's always a beautiful sighting. I mean, like, yes, lions, you know, a lot of people say, oh, lions sleeping is, you know, it's it's boring, all this and that. But I, I find sometimes, you know, you let a, a sighting play play out. I mean, we could be sitting here, these lines could be passed out, and next moment you get like a, a lonely buffalo coming through this area, and then what? You know, then all of a sudden you're going to get action. So things can change very, very quickly. I believe that's always so say, let, let, the, let, the, let the sighting play out. And that's it just to watch him. I mean, look at this little one rolling and playing with his... Sibling. <laughs> oh, it's like, yep, there it is. Well, he wants an ear. So I'm like, listen to me. Listen to me. I've got something to tell you. <laughs> oh, no. But yes, it's always nice just to watch and sit there with him like this. And um, yeah, I'd say it's, uh, I don't think they're going to do too much for this for the day, for or for now, unless something does come through. Yeah, I think because those tummies, it seems like they have had something to eat last night, but nothing, nothing too huge. Because the tummies aren't big, big. <laughs> A little bit of playtime with these two. So out of these five cubs, three are male and two are female. 
but they will still be with the the males will still remain with the pride for quite some time. Oh, here comes the rain. Here comes the rain. Sorry, I'm just going to quickly try and cover a few things here. Sorry about that, everybody. Well, from lions to lions. We don't have any lions licking each other here, but we've got a lioness that's using her foot as a pillow. Hmm. She's very alert. There's definitely something going on that we are unaware of. As Cedric says, you know, watching sleeping lions. I mean, if it's the heat of the day, um, I, I try not to go to lions when it's boiling hot, but this time of morning, I'll sit with lions because things can change in a heartbeat. Things can change very, very quickly with cats. If I find lions next to a watering hole, I'll stay with them as well for a long time. I've had uh, in the past many guests who came with me who said, we want to see a kill. I'm like, okay, well then, when we find the lions close to a a watering hole we will spend the whole morning there until it happens and well I've had many 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 successful hunts that way and a lot of people want to see kills until they see them it can be quite difficult to watch quite difficult to watch but uh, she's not doing anything right now but that's all about energy conservation not far from a watering hole now called Twasa watering hole which is actually a little estuary or not an estuary but a, a, an inlet to the Groot Mariko River that's here and the, it's been inundated again there's a what's the dam called upstream? Molotedi. The Molotedi dam is upstream from here over the mountains there I actually saw it when I flew in now and it's huge there's a massive water body and when we came to Twasa watering hole the other day, it was nearly bone dry. And obviously what they've done is they've reflowed or reflooded the river because it's now full again. It's one of those practices that takes place when governments have taken over watering sources such as rivers that they need to keep the ecological flow of the water flowing because obviously damming a a river has got a lot of implications for the ecology of the area. But uh, in saying that, we are close to that water body now. And uh, she's practically on a game path now. So, you know, you could get zebras and wildebeest deciding it's nearly time to go for a drink. And then start wandering down that way. You see how quickly she pops her head up. We have another vehicle approaching, and so she just heard a noise and thought, hmm, let me check that out. Is that a meal on wheels for me? No, it's not my kind of meal. Corey, that is true. And the only reason we know that is because lions and most animals have been dissected and their eyes have been had a look at and there are two different types of cells that an eye is made out of. One is called the cone cell, which is what most of our eye is made out of. And as you can imagine, a cone, it looks like a cone. And that allows for color vision. Lions and most other animals that we see out here have got what we call rod cells. So they're much longer. They look like rods. And what the rods do is they enable animals to see in very very low light conditions. Um, it also gives them black and white vision. 
So although they might not see depth very well, because that's what cone cells allow you to do, to see depth and color, they see in low light conditions and they see movement and they see shapes very, very well. So most animals out here have got that, that element to them. And um, I've put this to the viewers before and I encourage you this evening when it's dark to test your nighttime vision. Um, here in South Africa, we've got load shedding all the time, so we are testing our nighttime vision constantly. So I implore you, when the lights go off or when your lights are off, walk in your house and try to find the light switch by looking straight forward. You won't see it, but if you walk sideways and look through the side of your eye, you will see exactly what's going on to the right or left of you, depending on where you're going. So if you ever are lost in your house trying to find the light switch or the door handle or whatever it is you're looking for, just look sideways, look out the side of your eye and you will actually see because the human eye has got a dominance of cone cells in the middle and we've got a little layer of rod cells on the outside of the human eye that enables us to see in low light. So whenever you're trying to see in low light, just look sideways. So turn your head and whatever you're looking at, try and look at it from the right or the left and you'll actually get a much better picture because those cone cells or the rod cells are bringing in extra extra light and obviously the need to see in black and white for predators is for hunting we've seen our infrared cameras that we have on they believe that that's what the predators are seeing something equivalent to that and then most of our prey animals that are out here to try and avoid being hunted and caught they want to be able to see in the dark. Obviously seeing during the daytime is helpful as well, but they can see shapes. They're looking for profiles and they're also picking up on the smell and sounds of animals trying to sneak up on them. So those animals with color vision, most birds, primates, including humans, and if cone cells are your dominant eye cell, then you are a daytime animal and at night you hide away in a cave, in a tree, in a hole, somewhere where you don't need to be able to see. And if there ever was a sea of vibrancy and life, I feel like this is it right here. These lovely colors that we've got here. So we just started with Scotia Dam. Lovely saturating colors. Look at the color of the Sinyala's legs. is full sort of caramel color. Still light coming. Um, so there are one or two thin sort of wispy clouds up in the sky like we mentioned earlier it's definitely going to get hot but we've still got some beautiful sunlight before it really starts to rise all too high in the sky and become much tougher to deal with much harsher and we've had some uh, yellow bull ducks coming and going you can just see one on the right frame there and yes I had uh, Steve mentioning uh, about water being the currency of life and I feel like that's just so true you know it brings so much activity right here to something like Scotia Dam and I feel like in the bigger picture as well I mean you look at when we had the whole sort of COVID-19 pandemic how everything changed just overnight like that and you know it's not just for these yellow bull ducks and the Sinyala that we're looking at you can imagine for for us some water short that happened overnight you know people can't really go much longer than three days without water so it really is the currency of life
actively feeding too much. You can see him kind of swiveling his head every now and then. Those ears are up. He's listening carefully. I'm not too sure if he kind of uh, pushed through those thickets on the left-hand side there because I didn't really see him walk around the edge of, of the thicket. I mean, I've been sitting a little bit of birding and he kind of popped up out of nowhere. Welcome back everyone. Well, our lioness has gotten a bit sleepy, but she is vigilant. You might hear vehicles, as you know, we're not the only vehicle in this sighting. This is open to the other lodges. And we are driving out of Jackie's safari lodges here in Medique. just north by about how far by about maybe 300 meters from the airstrip the eastern airstrip here in Medique is a hub of activity and uh, she is uh, just gonna go back to sleep well that is her want Seems to be what Cedric was saying before when you have lions lying down like this. People don't generally stay for very long. Linma, I'm not sure I understand your question if they see the light reflection in other animals, because what light reflection is there? What they're seeing is movement and shape. And it's why when we look at animals like a kudu or a bushbuck or a leopard, their disruptive camouflage makes them blend in. Because if you've got black and white vision, you can't see depth. You see shape and movement. So you've seen how our leopards go up termite mounds. They go with their head flat and their body flat, their ears flat, because they're trying to prevent the impalas allowing them to see that typical leopard shape. Think of the Garfield image that everybody knows so well, those ears and that head. The general game, that's what they see. They don't see the spotted cat. They don't see the teeth or the nose. <laughs> they don't see the uh, spotted animal at all. They see the shape and the movement. And apparently I'm sending over to myself over in Juma. You know, it's just so, uh, so you can insert the expletive of your choice, typical. They had a lovely shot there of a Cape turtle dove, and as we went live, it flew off. Anyway, we've got some other things here. We've got buffalo at Buffalo Corner Waterhole on the northeastern side of Juma Private Game Reserve. There they are, and they've been very reliable at this area uh, for the last ooh, week or so, I guess. They popped down twice a day to have a drink. We're parked where we are because we're sheltering underneath what passes for a sheltering sort of a tree. The drizzle, which we thought would stop, has uh, not really stopped, although it has lessened somewhat. So here we are, 
with these Movolo. It astounds me that one of their number doesn't appear to have been taken out by lions unless one has been taken out by lions somewhere north of our border. I just don't think they'd still be in the area if one of them had been set upon because this is prime lion food and maybe the reason that they're not being kind of oh quickly over there and Paul there's a Mrs. Robinson situation look at that up 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 right there and straight there, there those two that is a dastardly situation there that um, that deeply aged cow has uh, seduced that young male who uh, really, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's disturbing to watch. With two yellow-billed oxpeckers looking on, or one at least. Well, I suppose he's obviously quite a, he's obviously a mover and shaker. And that other one obviously came up and said, I really don't approve of what's going on here. And the young male said, off you go. Sorry, we had a comment or a question there. I was just so astounded by the fact that that young male was trying to mate with that aged cow that I, uh, I lost my train of thought entirely. Oh, Asna, you say this is a massive herd. Yes, I reckon between 150 and 200 animals. You know, you will find them up to 1,000 in the height of the dry season when the water is very concentrated and I think that 150 to 200 is pretty big for this time of the year. So the other thing I wanted to say about lions and that sort of thing is that the lions are in such a state of flux at the moment with breakaways and normal prides and arguments over which ones should be the breakaways and which ones should be the actual pride that I, I think they're probably eating smaller stuff at the moment. You know, they're moving around a lot and sort of trying to re-establish all their boundaries and that sort of thing, and I, I suspect they're not. They're kind of taking on smaller stuff. A lot of impala taking pastings, I think, during the night. We don't even see them being eaten because they get devoured so quickly. These guys are very at peace, though. Some of them are having a little bit of a spa there, but they're certainly not a serious fight at all. Hmm. Mandy, this is a lovely question, which I really enjoy because it sets me off on one of my favorite topics. So the African buffalo, Sincaris, C-A-F-F-E-R, Kafer, has never been... Uh, domesticated effectively for milk. That said, if you do raise a buffalo calf, they are pretty tame. They're not, they're not really an issue. In Asia, they have domesticated the Asian water buffalo, which is a close relative of the African or Cape buffalo. But the thing is that animals in Africa evolved with people. And as long as human beings and our ancestors have been standing on two feet. We've been throwing stones, spears, sticks, setting traps, etc. for these animals. And it means that they have evolved a, an inherent fear of human beings. And that means that they're inherently relatively or potentially dangerous to human beings. And for that reason, the domestication of African animals has really never taken place. It's why no buffalo have really been domesticated. Zebras were never domesticated. Uh, hippos, apparently, which could produce milk and meat, uh, have never been domesticated. Well, I mean, they are really quite homicidal. It's an interesting, if you take it further and get into a very famous book called Guns, Germs and Steel by Jared Diamond 
uh, the trajectory of human development, if you like, on the African continent has been severely um, hampered in many ways by the lack of domesticatable animal species on the continent. And as soon as the Oroch was domesticated in the Middle East, that's the ancestor of, the, of modern cattle, African people immediately adopted those for domestication. But that was, of course, hundreds of, or certainly tens of thousands of years uh, after, tens of thousands of years after people had left Africa and found much more easily domesticatable animals. That's really very interesting. So thank you for that question. I do enjoy it very much. Join us from the 23rd to the 27th of January for a week of back to school special safaris tailored specifically towards our future conservationists. Our naturalists will exclusively be taking questions from schools across the globe. Tune in for some entertaining animal education to ease you back into the school year because fostering the upcoming generations of conservationists matters. Just in time for the yawn and the territory marking and now she's going to walk right towards us. She's obviously going to pick one of these game paths and she's decided it's time to go and get something to drink. She is a beautiful girl. What a precious girl you are. And she's walking right behind us. We're just going to give her one moment. As soon as Ryan tells me that she's moved, we're going to follow. She's going to go and have a drink. But unfortunately, I think where... Is she good? Where the watering hole is, it's a little bit of a dip. And so we might lose you. She stood up. She smelled the bush, she scent marked, she yawned, and then she gave us a walk by. 
and she came as close to us as she wanted to and that is the key that is the key with wildlife is they will make they will cover the distance and you see how she even just went a little bit more that was her comfort zone her boundary her space so I hope we're going to be able to get another view of her here but I have a feeling that when we get down to the water's edge there that it's going to be a bit tricky so I'm just going to move up to the side here be able to get her from an angle let's just get onto the road get a nice view of her walking past I'm going to just put her on the side of you here around Ah, oh, there's going to be a fence, which is unfortunate, but it is what it is. Should I do the side or the nose? I'm going to do the nose. She's going to come behind that bush there. There we go. She's busy rubbing her face. Poor little Franklin just lost its mind a moment ago. It was just having a nice morning scratch and suddenly there was this ferocious beast walking nearby. The intention is clear. She looked up towards the water and it's not far away. She's going to walk straight there. I'm surprised we don't have any baboons shouting every time we've been here with lions. The baboons have gone crazy. We're right on the eastern side of Madikwe now. Isn't she pretty? Yes, just stop and have a look back. That's how the models do it, you see. That's why they call it the catwalk. Sorry about the pole. Sue, isn't she gorgeous? She is she is a pretty she's a pretty lady. But you know she she wants a good drink, but at the same time she knows that this is an opportunity other animals might be here. So it's not that she's being cautious for her own sake or her own safety. She moves in slowly because, you know, she might see an opportunity to catch something. There's lots of dense cover and bush around this watering hole. The perfect hiding place for a lioness. For a pride of lions, in fact. almost see her thinking. Are you looking at me? Are you going to follow me down to the water? Hmm. And three, two, one. Mandy, she's not currently nursing. Uh, you notice her mammary glands. It was an indication that she's had cubs. But I believe that they're subadults already. I don't know. I don't know the full history. What wonderful light. Is she going to walk straight down to the water on the road, which appears to be a game path to her. And that's why we use roads so often for tracking, because well, our animals use them, thankfully. Thankfully, they find it easier to walk on the roads just like we do to drive on them. It makes for quiet passage, easy passage, and they can walk it quicker if they need to. And silently, behind the bush, she goes. Okay, well, we're going to see if we can get another view of our lioness down by the water. In the meantime, let's send you down to Mr. James Hendry.
Now, we're still with our beef aloes. We've moved a little bit because the rain has desisted briefly. And we're watching the beef aloes, who are just sort of swimming, wading, chatting to each other, drinking a bit, fouling the water with their own waste, that sort of buffalo thing. Okay, quickly across to Pridelands. Thank you for joining us. We, we managed to find the uh, pixie pan female. She, she looks like more hunting. You can see, I don't know whether, oh, and you can keep this from the back. It's something that I've spotted here. We're not sure exactly what it might be. We're in the middle of the block, but what we're going to do at the moment, the meantime, while we, we're having you on board, let's try to reposition ourselves in order to see this cat clearly. I believe that uh, maybe we might even see what she's after. It's so much important to see what she might be trying to hunt here. Then we can position ourselves in a better uh, position, of course, an area where we're not going to disturb on the hunt itself. A little bit thick, it's not easy to drive here, but uh, uh, it's more relaxed. Mother of the two cubs that we were follow yesterday, she looked like she have left the cubs and now doing for doing hunting for the little ones. She was there, the last position. I've seen her. She was moving not far from. Let's uh, take this opportunity over to Cedric. Yes, nice. I reckon got a pixie pan there in Pridelands, but yes, it is some difficult areas around there with the signal side of things. But yeah, we are here at Juma with the Telemati breakaways. Well, the very sleepy Telemati breakaway. As you can see, the three females and the five youngsters with uh, the S8 male, but he's now gone into a very thick area and he is also quite flat for the morning. But yes, um, I agree with Steve, it is definitely a fur day, not a Thursday. Definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of fluffy cats this morning. And it's a lot of tawny cats this morning. But, uh, <laughs> but the, these uh, Telemati breakaways, they are absolutely flat. I think uh, it seems like their night has been really, really rough. But yeah, while well, we're going to sit here with our very sleepy uh, cats, let's head back to Rexon in Pridelands. It is unbelievable. Uh, Pixie Pan female looks so cute. It's one of the leopards, I believe, that uh, she's not that much old. I was thinking maybe she will be over seven years age of old but uh, by the looking of the coat of the animal itself she might be still under that she's really amazing she's trying the opportunity of hunting around the fallen trees it could be something that of course she tend to smell in the area again let me try to uh, keep the views of this leopard and follow her through this thicket maybe she might come out from Bamba Road to the east We'll see how it goes. She's very promising. The way she's moving in the area, she might make a kill uh, today, this morning. I believe that uh, she's more energetic you can see time and again changing direction, getting assigned, and she seems like a lot more active. It could be a joy this morning following this particular leopard. I just believe that uh, we, we, we have to follow and see where she's where she going to take us to. Okay, let me, I don't want to waste time. Let me stay with her 
Then I can see where she's gonna take us to. Cross finger here, we, we, we might see something good. Okay. Have to be gently here. There's quite a lot of fallen trees pushed by elephants. Try to stay with this leopard. It's very exciting to see leopard uh, moving in this kind of uh, hunt and just give you guarantee that you're staying with a cat that is always active. Sometimes it might surprise you come across with scrub hair and just make it kill. It can be ate anytime. It's very interesting. She's moving from one flowing tree to another. Pretty much, maybe in the course of a night or early part of this morning, she has seen something that uh, ran away from her. She's trying maybe a baby grey deck or baby steenbuck because all the time they need to hide and lie down. And most of their time, it's really, really important. While they're still young, they need more time. To relax in order to be safe around because running around you may spot it by a leopard if you're weak you will be always targeted you see leopard doesn't have general direction but I just believe this female pixie pan female if you realize that uh, she don't see what might be she looking for I believe that she might go up in a tree and try to see what might be far ahead from the area where she's moving. It's in the nature of a leopard to going up in trees, but especially if she looks around and she doesn't find whatever she's looking for. See that kind of nature? It's a really log that is lying down, trying to extend itself to see better. Oh, lovely. I love leopard ones. It does that. You'll be able to see and also look at the coat itself. The rosette mark is unbelievable. Cross finger for her to go up on the tree. She's listening all the time. We, we just uh, uh, really, after we went to the hyena, and unfortunately there was no coverage there. The hyena are covered in blood. So it might happen that uh, she was successful early part of this morning, and the hyena had just covered and stole the kill away, or stolen the kill away from the leopard. And the leopard is looking for opportunity to hunt and kill. This time of the day, you can see that it's a little bit windy here, and of course, a leopard can be so much successful in a windy day. She's going in circle. I believe she's going. Oh, look at that. I love that. Maybe changing her thought, going up in a tree. That is more common with leopard. Come on, Pixie Pen. Oh, hyena just arriving. There's a hyena to the left getting into the scene here. It'll be... It'll be nice. Oh, look at that. Hyena on the frame now. He's trying to, to, to stay behind the, the leopard. Is what we have seen with James yesterday. Wild dogs. Leopard, after leopard, wild dogs come and steal the kill away for Clara and the lion coming into into rock. It's always it's always like that in the bush, and once you get to see that 
it's really magic. It's something that uh, it's really appreciable. It looks like this uh, hyena is not concentrating a lot because the leopard is not far there. But you can tell that he's checking behind the leopard, thinking that the leopard might have him killed. He might turn around. The only thing that he thought all the time is the leopard having a kill in the area come and steal away. So if he doesn't have a scent of the leopard, I think possibilities of coming back and force the leopard up in the tree is very high. And the pixie pan female, due to these activities of uh, hyenas, I don't think she will feather the hunt. She might uh, Man, they are fly to 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 get that info. Sexy one, oh lovely, sexy one. Pixie pan female. It, it's a mother, of course, um, and uh, I believe that uh, Shimungwe is a father of uh, the first litter of uh, pixie pan female. Unbelievable, if so relaxed. I believe that uh, is one of the great leopard we have in the area 61 which is a lot more uh, relaxed than the 62 62 in the course of a day unrelaxed wow thank you for identification of the leopard because i know that uh, pixie panty is the only the female that a lot more relaxed in the area due to uh, look at the behavior of uh, 62 that's so much unrelaxed but this is amazing sexy one this is my first time to come across with this uh, leopard and even seeing 62 i went a clear identification of a leopard because she was in a distance wow apparently with the information of the leopards here she it was a, a male that used to be a hang around the cups that uh now with the Pixie pan female, they are thinking that uh, it could be a pale, pale, pale face male or pale male, something like that. It's one of the leopards that roam around in the area as a territorial male. You know that Chimungwe might be not in the area, maybe have moved into other areas. That happened quite a lot when the leopard really come and mate with the land, take over. It's always a challenge. You know, out in the bush, survival of the strongest, or oh, you, you cannot really be in the area more than uh, four to five years. It happens that if you take over, even pale face world, he might be further in his cup. The next um, offspring, he might not mate with the female because of competition is too high. Most especially if you look at this uh, uh, area, a proudly in eco training safari life. It shows that it could be a lot of leopard. The only thing, most of the leopard that might not relax. But of course, success rate of the leopard here, it will be very good. No much hyenas. It tend to be a lot more area where leopard can den and be more successful to raise the cubs. Unlike other areas down south, the sands with lots of hyenas and the limited area. Of course, in the area of Juma, there's no copies or there's no rocky area than what you see here. It's more um, lots of uh, copies here where leopard likes the most to be on that area. And lions can be so much well um, successful when it comes to youngster. Wow, we wish the hyena to come back. Maybe the leopard might go up in the tree. It can, she can relax. Yes, uh, I do apologise once again there with uh, Rexon. As I said, it is in a, a very difficult area with the signal. Like I said, he's got the sexy one, beautiful female leopard. 
And of course, yeah, we're still with the Talamati. He's got the uh, Talamati breakaway. He's still got the one female that's just busy grooming herself. And especially with a little bit of rain that we've had now over the last uh, hour or so. Not much rain, but like a drizzle. And uh, sometimes it's nice for them because now all that little bit of droplets, water droplets, is sitting on their coat. And of course, just uh, licking their coat like this actually get a little bit of moisture for themselves so they don't really need to go around to any little pan or dam and get enough moisture from from their coat. Yes, indeed. Mm. But it looks like they uh, when we went to go, because I had to go back uh, to get my, my rain roof on and uh, on the way back to the camp I actually saw that they came past dam camp this morning or early la or late last night or early this morning. I see the tracks come right past the dam camp. Of course, and my whole idea of coming up towards Gauri Dam was to look for Molawati, the male leopard that was around here last night. And yeah, well, by doing that, of course, we bumped into these beautiful lions. But yeah, when we saw the S8 male, of course, walking past and uh, one or two of the cubs getting up, I thought they had something to eat, like something substantial, but it does definitely not. Um, most of their tummies are very, very flat at the moment, so I don't think they had anything really to eat last night. I think they will rest here for the day and maybe later this afternoon, hoping that they'll still be around. Sorry, was it Mandy or Nandy? Mandy, it Mandy. Mandy, yes. So what happens, you'll find that they've got little glands there between their pugs and all that. So what happens, they'll actually, they'll actually put the, when they actually kind of stretch and they actually kind of uh, claw the trees. Like sometimes, like you call it like a rubbing post for like rhinos and that, but sometimes you'll find lions will actually scratch against the trunk and all that. And yes, they'll actually leave a little bit of like a scent uh, behind from the gland that's between the pugs. Or almost like marking a territory. Exactly the same as urinating or, you know, like a leopard spraying and all that, all the scent markings. So, yes, they will definitely leave a scent behind. Oh, she's got an injury on her foot, eh? Just looking. Oh, I'm sorry, I just want to quickly get hold of this guy again. She's got a bit of a cut on her foot, her back right foot. Uh, standing by, go. Hmm. I not see that. Morning, yeah, I just wanted to let you know. Uh, copy that, Dion. Uh, yes, we just got the Telemati breakaways here on Twin Dams Road, um, not too far from Gary Dam. Uh, just uh, that's his only, and I think there was also Shlambi and Yari that uh, James had as well somewhere on Juma. Sorry, I'm just gonna just let the guys know what's happening on Juma. Uh, Affirmative, they love Pansy. Yeah, just letting the other guys know what's happening here on Juma because uh, they just gave me an update on of uh, sounds like in Sumi. Of course, that is uh, Kashaba's uh, youngster, the little female leopard. That's uh, towards Chitwa side, but it sounds like quite far to or close to Cheetah Plains driveway. That's very far east. And uh, so, yeah, at least we know that she's still around that area. And um, I'm not too sure. They see those are lions. I know that they had lions on uh, Koro uh, Dam Cam, or not the Dam Cam, but the Pan, Pan Cam, in Koro Cam. Some cam there at the pan, and they had the Nkuuma sub adults. I think it was uh, Nkuuma sub adults uh, last night. I thought I just saw some screenshots from that side, so looks like they're all the way east. But it's nice to see that the Telemartis, well, this is part of their territory, this pride. I mean, the Telemarty breakaways, they can they come down towards this area. I think this is almost like the furthest south that they will really push. Um, I think I'm trying to think how far south. I've seen them towards Ingwe Alley, and that Ingwe Alley is around about maybe only 100 meters south of us. 
and I've seen them, that, that's the furthest south I've seen this pride. So it just shows you they are pretty much on the most furthest southern boundary of their territory. Now, I thought they won't push any further south because of those new uh, black dam mail lines, the two mail lines that's been coming into the area recently. And um, But I think uh, those two black dam mail lines, uh, I think they've gone further south in towards Mala Mala side. So they're very far from here now. So I think that's why they're not too bothered. But yeah, but it looks like this female uh, line with a cut on the foot, it's not too bad. It looks like an old wound. So it's something, that, I mean, they're all walking normal. So definitely it's not hindering her, her ability to move around. I have uh, taken off my rain gear because thankfully the weather has improved somewhat since last we saw you. Here we have got a hibiscus flower and this is not the same hibiscus that I showed you yesterday, hibiscus cannabinus. Uh, I have as usual forgotten exactly which hibiscus this is but I will find out shortly because I know someone's going to tell me and I'm going to take a photograph of it so that I might put it in my little folder of photographs called flowers. And in those, that folder I will hopefully have uh, some memories of the flowers. Let me get my um, capture device, which used to be a communication device but is now much more a multimedia computer in the palm of your hand. The important thing with these hibiscus flowers is the leaves because the flowers all tend to look pretty much identical. Come on now. There we go. Focus. That's it. Excellent. Right. Then I'm going to point out one other flower or plant. This is an interesting plant. I mean, is it that interesting? It's probably not. In honesty, it's probably not that interesting. It is called Dombea rotundifolia, or the wild pear. And I always like it because I think of um, pear puddings and that sort of thing, although I've never seen a fruit on a Dombea, and therefore I couldn't tell you what this wild pear tastes like. And that is the end of my plant segment. Got 30 seconds left to waffle on about not much. I shall walk slowly towards the vehicle looking pensive. Now trying to look cinematic. Thank you all. Welcome back everybody. We're really happy that we're in a position that we're able to broadcast. We feel like if we go any further in here, we're not going to be. And our lioness has moved down to the water. Away found herself the perfect bit under what I think is an umbrella thorn. I can't tell from here. But in some nice long grass grass is probably still quite dewy and quite damp over there so nice and cool and she's only about 20 to 30 yards from the water point now itself so she's in even a better position than she was before and behind me there is an impala that is kind of on its way here so she hasn't seen it the impala hasn't seen it either but uh, she is in an ambush position. There's a game path that runs directly down past us here to the water and I've no doubt a number more that move in a similar direction of hoof falls, grass moving, branches, anything like that. 
So behind us is a big male impala who's feeding and slowly making his way down. Just but he's on. Oh, actually, there's another couple in a line behind him, slowly moving step by step towards the water. Okay, well, we're going to stay here and see if anything transpires. In the meantime, I'll send you over to Cedric. Well, that's it. Yeah, we're just uh, still sitting at the Telemati breakways, and you can just see just all the paws are pretty much in the air at the moment all fast asleep and uh, <laughs> absolutely I love uh, I love those paws I love the tracks of a lion and of course a leopard as well I think they've got really really sexy tracks absolutely enjoy them but as you can see that <laughs> there's no movement here so I'm just gonna spend a little bit of uh, my last little bit of uh, time with them before I'm gonna move on I'm gonna try as I said my whole idea was actually heading into the area for Molawati so I might try Gary Dam and take a look around that side. <laughs> Linmar, yes they do. They look absolutely fantastic. Great condition, uh, the Telemati breakaways. Brilliant uh, condition. And uh, I will definitely get you the number of the beauty parlor. Oh, unfortunately, they're all forced to sleep. I'll have to wait for them to wake up and then I can maybe get that number for you. But for now, I don't think they really care about me. They're not too bothered on what's happening. But yes, as I say, this kind of day, very, very, it's not very cold, but it's very, it's very windy. Um, a little bit of drizzle that comes through now and again. Um, it is quite cool. And I think they will, they'll just doing what lines enjoy doing early in the morning if it's this kind of weather and that is to sleep and they will rest like this for the whole day you know, 10 to 1 most probably this afternoon we come back to back into this area they won't be far they'll be uh, somewhere maybe tucked under a bush somewhere away from the elements and uh, I'm sure we can relocate on them again Definitely that female that's got her belly up in the air. Now right at the back of her is one of the youngsters and it looks like the, the young cub is almost like holding her back left uh, leg. Well, it looks like she's holding it like there. You can see it's almost like holding her back leg, like almost like a teddy bear. You know, like, or like, you know when you're a kid, you got like a little blanket with you or something like that. It seems like that little one has got uh, mom's leg and it's just holding onto it like like it's enjoying it. <laughs> so cute. All right, I hear a lot of birds, a lot of long calls behind me at the moment. Uh, Franklins and that. I'm not too sure. I mean, I've been hearing them going crazy for the last, say, 15, 20 minutes. The same as there's some squirrels as well that's going quite crazy. I wonder if it's not maybe Mulawati. You never know. Brazza, Brada. Well, I'm, you know what? It's, I'm glad. I'm hoping that you're going to heal very quickly, Brazza, because uh, knee surgery. I can imagine that is not uh, the nicest thing. But I'm glad that we. I'm glad that we can at least uh, make your day uh, much better with all these amazing sightings. And uh, yes, oh, I, I had a bad knee years ago. I had a bad knee, and it felt like. Um, because I used to play a lot of cricket and also my one knee, knee started to give me a lot of problems and eventually I had to, uh, luckily my brother's a chiro, chiropractor and he gave me some exercises to do and it helped me quite a bit so just to strengthen the muscles and that around my joint or my knee itself. Yeah, it's starting to drizzle again, uh, the rain is starting to come back again so you can 
can see a little bit of movement here. I think maybe this female going for a toilet break there. No, she wants to go and lie down that side. There we go. Looks like she's comfortable there. Yeah, but it's 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 wonderful that like sometimes if you're sitting at home and all that and you can't you know your your mobility is hindered because of uh, surgery or something. It's always nice just to sit back and enjoy these safaris and just enjoy all these amazing animals that we've got here to show you. But yes, talking about that, let's head over to Nick in the Eastern Cape and to see what he's got to show you. Okay, and we've definitely got a beautiful scene here at Kariha. Temperatures are starting to get up there and plenty of different species coming down to Scotia Dam here. Massive herd of Impala. And I did have to have a little bit of a chuckle there with, uh, with Cedric. Comment of uh, the number for the hair salon for those lions. <laughs> I feel like these Impala need to get a bit of recognition as well. You know, I guess if you look at the at, at like a mane of a male lion, a beautiful thick big mane, it is. It's definitely very impressive. It's uh, it's regal, you know. It, it's awe inspiring. But at the same time, I mean, look, these Impalas definitely don't have that same wow factor in terms of like a big massive sort of mop of hair of mane. But they're in such good condition, even zoomed out like this. Have a look how their, their coat is shining. And technically speaking, that male doesn't that male line doesn't put any wax or anything in there. These guys, it looks like they've waxed their, their hair. You know? Not wax doesn't take it off, but put a bit of like hair gel inside there. Anyways, that uh that grey heron doesn't agree with what I'm saying. Off he goes. But I feel like Scotia Dam is uh, going to be a good place to spend a good portion of the day today. I mean, what are we now? Seven o'clock only, and there's been Blessbook coming down. I mean, this herd of Impala, there must be a good 40, maybe even 50 of them. Some of them have started to move off. So there hasn't been been anything with any of the males today. Remember we talked yesterday a little how a lot of the males are chasing each other. I've never heard of it going dry. I mean there's there's always the potential but uh it is it is relatively deep. It could hold a good amount of water. Remember, a lot of the, the surrounding mud wallows and things like that have dried up. And I can definitely see if I, if I kind of have a, a scan around at the edges of, uh, of the water itself, that the water line has receded a little bit, but there's definitely still a good amount of water here, and I don't see it going dry anytime soon. But we're going to take you across to Steve in Madikwe. Thanks Nick. Well, not very easy to see, but our lioness is there. She's a little bit flat because there's some impala and some zebra that have come down to where we originally had her coming down to the watering hole and she did some scent marking and some spraying there and uh, they were alarm calling a moment ago because of the residual smell. Now she's sort of weighing up her desire to move through this thicket and expend energy to go and catch one of them. She probably hopes one might come a bit closer to her and then she doesn't have to expend as much energy. But there's lots of cover here, lots of long grass, lots of dense vegetation, and a few zebras have moved off, but four or five impala rams have come down and they're not very happy with life. They're a bit tentative, as Nick was saying before, and it's something we use, term I use often, water is the currency of life. 
His animals have to come down and drink. It is a very important element to their survival. And the impala are moving back towards me. But still a distance from her. We'll just keep the camera on her for now. The impala came down on a path more to our left. They didn't like it. They're coming back on a path closer towards her. But they're still a good 45 yards away. Crystal love South Africa. The only different lion behavior I've seen here is the propensity of this, these lions to enjoy the tarmac of the airstrip. But uh, I suppose it's nothing new. I see a lot of lions in the Kruger on the tarmac of the Kruger Tard Roads. You find them on those roads all the time. Obviously in Juma we don't have any tarred roads. And I don't recall having found lions often in the Savi Sands on one of the airstrips. But the airstrips that are there are all gravel. Namely Chitwa. Had wild dogs and leopards around the airstrip. I haven't seen anything different. I mean lions in general are pretty much lions. And wherever they come from they behave in a very similar fashion. And they've evolved to fill a certain niche in their society, in their ecological role, and uh, that is what they do. They've had a lot of calling, but from what I've seen, all pretty similar. I saw two youngsters chasing a brown hyena the other day, which for me was quite special because I'd never seen that before. Brown hyena nearly got caught by a young sub adult male lion. Rian, do you remember the look on that hyena's face? It was too quick for, for us to get it on camera, but that hyena was running for its life, and I don't think you could draw a caricature that would make an animal look more frightening than that brown hyena did. Would you like a stay in the African bush? Open to all explorers. Sign up and stand a chance to win a three-night stay for two at the fantastic Mashatu Lodge in Botswana. This bucket list prize includes daily safari drives, traditional African cuisine, spacious luxury suites, and a promise of sheer relaxation. Sign up now and stand a chance to win.
Well, there we go, everybody. Can you see her? Exactly. She is in there. Now, with the, the screen, with the camera, she's invisible. Just hidden underneath that grass. There. I keep checking with my binoculars, and I can see her there in the middle of screen. That black spot just above or in between the grass is her ear. There's a, a few more in parlor that have materialized down here. And her attention is poised and focused. We talk earlier about black and white vision. When she's in the long grass like that, they can't see her. They need to see the shape of her to pick up on her. And they pick up on that shape incredibly quickly. That's why when we see leopards and lions hunting, they crouch, they go flat, they change what we call the search image. If you've heard of the word search image before, they did some studies with, I think it was a starling or it could have been a magpie, whereby they gave a magpie. Okay, well, we'll carry on with that story in a little while and we'll send you over to James. Now we have got a leopard here and uh, I don't know who this leopard is which is slightly embarrassing but we are far on Chitwa and I think if I'm not horribly mistaken um, oh gee I don't know actually I'm gonna wait for you guys to tell me who this is somebody made mention of a cat called Ntsumi or who I don't know. Uh, I think it is. Uh, in fact, I have seen this cat. I have seen this cat. It isn't Sumi, I think. And I think it's Guch Nkanyeni's daughter. I could be incorrect. Now, Nkanyeni was a very famous leopard from this part of the Sabi Sands. Oh, and there's a hyena in front of us. She's got a kill in the tree. It's a little steenbok, which had a very bad evening. I don't know why this cat isn't on my list of my list of leopards. I obviously haven't I've done a very good job of it yet. I'm still working on it since my return. You can see the hyena now going to the base of the tree. Okay, good. So I was correct. It is indeed Guchava's daughter, Nsumi. I am pleased to report. Thank you for that, for those of you who have confirmed it for me. Gachava recently deceased, sadly. That's how it goes with these leopards. She lived a good long life and left a good legacy though, so that's okay. The sun has come out. And James Richard, thank you very much for inevitably giving me the correct information. Hmm. Very nice. Very nice indeed. And I was when we heard about this cat I thought to myself, oh dear, oh dear, it's so far on Chitwa I don't think that we will have any view of this cat. But here we are with the view of this cat. So I met her last year at Cheetah Plains, at Nkoro, sorry, when we were staying at Jackie's Safari House. Hello, Crystal loves South Africa. You say you're so happy that I've got rosettes in sight. Yes, uh, I'm also very happy I have rosettes. Up in this gorgeous tree. I mean, it's a magnificent tree, this torchwood. I 
I mean, that really is an absolutely quintessential leopard pose, isn't it? Spectacular. And that's, I mean, that's a hell of a climb to get up there. It's about, I'd say she's 10 meters off the ground and she's pulled the kill all the way up there. And unusually for a torchwood tree, it's actually got some nice flat plain branches that are sort of marula-esque. Yeah, that's a great shot. And poor, by a donkey. Kill <laughs> Lebo, I don't know that leopards have a particular preference for trees that they climb. Some leopards tend to have specific individual trees that they like to spend time in. But I think that, you know, they tend to be relatively... When they've got a kill, uh, they take it up the safest tree that they can as soon as they can. And if that happens to be a beautiful tree like this, then that's great. If it happens to be a rather scraggly quarry bush like Kara's effort yesterday, well, that's also fine, I guess. Another vehicle has just arrived. That's okay. They're allowed to be here. Fascinating. Now, on the 28th of this month, which is Saturday, if I'm not much mistaken, um, we are going to be doing a fireside chat. Can you believe it? Yes, a fireside chat. And the fireside chat will be a highlights package of the school drives that we've been doing, the back to school drives. We'll enjoy some of the more interesting children's questions that we were given during the course of the week. We will discuss children in the wilderness. We may even have a small and silly song that you can all join in with. And if there are kids, if you are likely to watch it with kids, that would be great. And you can They can send through their questions or comments during the course of that fireside chat. So that'll be, I think, at 8 o'clock Central African time in the evening on Saturday the 28th. Live and exclusive. She has naturally decided to put her head the other side, which is inconvenient, I would say. It's not unkind so much as inconvenient. <clears throat> We might have to move around the other side just now. We'll just give her a few few minutes because these leopards tend to shift about when they're lying in the trees like this. I don't believe it's particularly comfortable for them. It is a wonderful tree to lie in though. She must feel so safe up there. Nice breeze. Nice warming sun after the rain. Delicious meal of soon to be rancid Steenbok waiting for her. The Steenbok, in case you're wondering, is the bit of sort of flappy stuff to the right and above her.
Now, from a photographic and, <clears throat> excuse me, filming point of view, this is quite tricky. And it's tricky because she's lying against such a very bright white background. And that means that, I mean, you may or may not be interested in this, I'm not sure, but it might help to explain why some of our shots in a situation like this can sometimes not look great. The reason is that you have to tell the camera to expose for whatever you want to show. And in this case, we want to show the leopard. But the leopard is quite dark in comparison with the bright white background. And that means that in order to show her, we have to push up the exposure. And you do that in a number of ways. But the result of that is that the background blows out. And so you can get these kind of artifacts around the leaves especially, and even around the edge of the leopard herself. But it's the only way, when she's lying against such a bright white background, that you're able to show that. And it would be even worse from the other side, because unfortunately the sun is uh, in the, really in the wrong place. And it's the problem when, it's a problem that you faced whenever a leopard is high up in a tree like that. It'd be a little bit easier if it was a dark black background. So if a big grey cloud came through, it would be much easier. So, for those of you who are interested in that small photographic uh, tree ties, I, I hope that you are now going, oh, I s oh, right. Yes, of course, that makes sense. I am feeling slightly frustrated with myself because I have just recently updated my record of the leopards in this area and uh, I somehow neglected this one and that's just not good enough, James. I'm going to have to be much better. Anyway, I'm glad I figured out who Ntsumi was and it was confirmed by our great geniuses on the interweb. Yeah, I agree. Ladybug Sarah, you say, perfect tree to rest in. The view must be amazing. Yeah, I think the view is probably quite stunning from up there. Stunning view. I'm hoping she's going to move a little bit sometime soon. So I think what we'll probably do is just drive around her and see if we can't get a better view. While we do that, you're going to go over to Sedders and see what he has to offer you. I said, uh, James, I'm glad that uh, you got all in Sumi. Beautiful little leopardess set. And uh, while you're sitting with a leopard, I have decided to come down towards uh, Garik uh, Cutline and I've just picked up on this beautiful hingeback uh, totas. And he is just digging through some elephant dung, as you can see. And oh, he's now moving. He's not, not too happy. Now, why are you moving off now? Because it was eating on some of the skins of the marula fruit. So oh, he's decided to move off very quick. Now you can see the hinge at the back of, uh, of its shell. So it pretty much moves like a, a hinge itself. So in case it has to reposition itself or actually maneuver itself over certain areas, that that hinge will pretty much help it to do that. But now it looks like it's just decided to 
run off. Well, that is running, I think. Looks like that's running. Because, yeah, how quick was that? He moved very quickly. <laughs> who, says a, who says a tortoise cannot move quickly? Well, there it is. It moved very quickly. But yes, uh, it was interesting. It was actually eating some of the skins. So there was, of course, uh, elephant dung uh, that was on the road there. And, of course, in that dung was a lot of the little fruits, marula fruits. And some of the marula fruits, the skin itself has been like, kind of peeled off. And, of course, that tortoise has decided to go and feed on some of the skins around there. But he's not doing that anymore. He's just decided to move off. All right, so I'm going to carry on down uh, central. I've still got a lot of alarm calling around here because this um, morning when I was sitting with those uh, Telemati breakaway lions, it sounded like a lot of squirrels, a lot of Franklin's alarm calling here. I've also got some Batalia, it's a bird of prey. That's also calling in this side. There comes. Uh, Lolly, well, first of all, the leopard tortoise, the shell is very much rounded off. It's more got a, like a typical round shell with a hinge, a uh, hingeback tortoise. Uh, it is very flat. It's not that round. It's got a very kind of a flat uh, uh, positioning of the shell. But uh, uh, leopard tortoise as well. Leopard tortoise gets a little bit larger. I think twice the size of a hingeback tortoise. I'm just see if I can see. So hingeback tortoises don't get large. I mean, they get just about that big. You know, that, that big. Compared to a leopard tortoise, I was in leopard tortoise is that big. So yeah, definitely the size uh, difference as well. All right, I'm just gonna go down near. Sorry, I just want to see what's alarm calling this side. Mm. And then I'm going towards Giraffe Crossing. So what happens, like there, I saw le a male leopard tracks coming into this direction as well from Gari uh, Dam. And I'm sure for Molawati. But you know, finding Molawati, yeah, <laughs> the ghost of Juma is quite uh, tricky. Very, very tricky. But yeah, let's see, let's see, let's see. Yeah, well, I'm going to continue. Let's head over to James to see what's happening with Nsumi. Hmm. Yes, here we are still sitting with our beautiful leopard. She's just been observing some tawny eagles going by. She's observed a, a hyena walking by. Sorry, I got myself mixed up there. It's this isn't Sumi, but Nsumi is not in Kanyeni's daughter. She's Guchava's daughter, which is why I suddenly didn't understand what on earth was going on. What an imbecile! must be very tiresome for those of you who are not imbeciles watching the show. But I'll figure it out eventually. When I'm about 60 or so. Yes, and I was not well pleased with the... Um, I was not well pleased with the spelling of her name. Um, <laughs> uh, most of you, yes, poor James Richard. I mean, he must tear what... He doesn't have any hair left. He's like me, unfortunately. He must be tearing his hair out when I say things like in Kanyeni's daughter. Of course, she's Kuchava's daughter. Her mother is alive and well. Please, <laughs> she's absolutely fine. Another nice one from James Richard, reminding us that she is Mvula's granddaughter. And lovely that his genetics are knocking about here in the northern Sabi Sands. Ah, <laughs> oh, goodness. Hey, very difficult being such a moron. Now, the reason I wasn't well pleased with the spelling of her name is that it's not... I, I, I get quite sort of ruffled by stuff like this. Her grandmother was Kurula. No, her great-grandmother was Kurula. And 
somehow that was spelled K-A-R-U-L-A, which is not a word in Shangan. The word is Kurula, K-U-R-H-U-L-A, and that, was, that means peaceful. And so I used to get very upset with this, and then I had big fights with people on Twitter about, you know, how or why it should be spelt like that, and I just felt like it's a local name, it's supposed to be a Shangan name, why don't we spell it the correct way? Anyway, and Sumi is spelled without the E. But there's another male leopard somewhere <clears throat> in the Sabi Sands that is spelt in Sumi with an I. And so all the uh, we decided to do is uh, just add an E to the end of this word, and therefore uh, it's not actually a word anymore. Um, yeah, anyway. I find these sorts of things very irritating because it indicates a lack of um, a lack of I think care Elizabeth you say I shouldn't be hard on myself everyone makes mistakes let me assure you Elizabeth as far as leopard identification goes very few people make as many mistakes as I do As Judy H is reminding me, it is. It was the spelling name. The name thing was decreed by none other than Panthera, that wonderful organisation of um, leopard researchers. Of course, they really don't care about names. You know, it's neither here nor there to them. As long as they've got identification on leopards, they don't really care. And that hyena we saw is Indabella. Thank you for that, Shreyas. Very kind. To tell us? Mavis, you're wondering if leopards can miscarry yeah, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure that they can. I'm pretty sure that they can miscarry. Uh, you know, if there's insufficient food, I'm sure they must have sometimes some kind of, you know, in utero trouble. I, you know, not all pregnancy will go to plan. Possibly first litters, they may miscarry. The thing is, we wouldn't see it, Mavis. We... It would just happen quickly uh, in private, and that and the leopard would just move on. So I'm sure it must happen. I, I can't see why it wouldn't. Right now I'm ruffling around a bit because I think we should try and move to the other side and see what kind of a picture we can get from there of Nsumi, badly spelled, daughter of Guchava, granddaughter of Tandi great-granddaughter of Karula, who meant the peaceful one. It's one of my pet bugbears, that. <laughs> you will not hear me speaking this game-drive language on the radio. I will never say, well, I'll try at, by all means to avoid saying Things like, we've got a yingui in the Pazulu, the which means basically their leopard up tree is, but in two or three different languages. Oh, I think we get a nice shot from here. My name is Melanie and I'm sitting in freezing cold Hobart, Tasmania 
which is a small island off the coast of Australia. I became an explorer for Wild Earth quite a number of years ago when they first advertised the positions. I'm so excited about winning the Rock Fig um, Prize, uh, which will be in the big way, and I cannot wait to have that adventure. And I thank the organisers um, so much for this opportunity. As you can see, and and Sumi, daughter of Guchava, granddaughter of Tandi, and great granddaughter of Karula, is now lying facing us, unfortunately behind a whole wall of trees. Now, if you are watching this for the first time, you might be thinking to yourself, what on earth is this blithering fool talking about? Who are the? the what are these names? What do they mean? Well, you're watching a live safari, and that means we are coming to you live from the western fringes of the Great Kruger National Park, also Madikwe and the Eastern Cape of South Africa. But more specifically, we've been co live from this area for ooh, on and off almost 10 years now, and our viewers and us have followed the lives of the leopards especially that live in this area and the story of the Juma royal lineage beginning with a leopardess called Safari continues through the genetics of leopards such as this one, Nsumi. So Safari was Nsumi's great great grandmother. She begat the very famous and much beloved Karula who in turn begat Tandi, and all of these leopards were known as the Queen of Juma. This one is not the Queen of Juma, she's moved off from there, but Safari's other great, great, grand, mm -mm, Safari's, Safari's great granddaughter, Tlalamba, is now the Queen of Juma. It's all rather confusing if you're a new viewer. Anyway, if you are a new viewer, it's lovely to have you with us. Please send us your questions and comments and join us every day for the sunrise and sunset safaris. It is cool, isn't it, Sir 50? You say the leopard family lives on. So it does. So it does.
So, a number of you now weighing in on the debate around the naming and just explaining it all. So thank you for that. And Tumi is not a male leopard, a female leopard down south. And this is obviously another one here uh, with the E. And the reason Panthea is doing this is because duplicate names obviously make research very confusing. Right, we're not going to go anywhere. Let's go back to Rex and find out what's happening with him there at Pridelands. Thank you for joining us. It's a lovely, lovely insane, of course, so with all leopards that are taking place this morning. We have this impala right at the uh, Njovo Dam Pride and Echo Training Safari Life. This is more common antelope that we have in the surrounding. The reason why we were stopping here, still, they are a little bit nervous. I think it's due to the wind that is, uh, I mean, it's, it's really just breaking out here and with the full speed it's so much uh, important for impala to be always safe around the, the area where the waterhole might be because really here it tend to be so much animal that comes down here that's reason even if they get the scent of the lions or leopard i think that makes them not happy around the water source itself and knowing that because of the wind they know that uh, maybe leopard can follow them behind they look like they break out from yesterday this is the same impala that we viewed them yesterday it looked like today they are a little bit um, separated it could be something that uh, makes them at night but especially lions were here remember early part of the morning we started our show with the young male lion and we can follow up with another tracks of a lion heading straight to the south so the waterfall the whole night it was busy that's the reason you find these animals are uh, not happy this is the mcdonald of the bush that feeds uh, cheetah feeds wild dogs and there were leopards mainly that we really enjoy them as our character some of them we have lovely sighting of this morning with one of the 61 female so for them to survive they have to hunt the impala impala a lot more common species around here and due to the water source the production of the leopard it's really good if it's a water they were all uh, happy to breed you know that uh, water it's life if there's no water in part they will move away from the area there's reason if you look at some of the uh, nature conservation areas where it's like a big water source you tend to see high population of the impala and the more we have impala the more the leopard will visit that particular area let's carry on maybe around uh, north uh, there's no much actually i wanted to start our show here at the dam this morning to show a little bit of uh, speed of the wind you can see lots of waves that really uh, at the water hole. even from this distance you can see that guarantee if our lions and leopard were hunting uh, here they would be a lot more successful like what jeff's have there and to me on the kill it's it's in the nature once it's more windy in the afternoon leopards and lions they will make a kill let us uh, take this opportunity over to james we haven't moved we're enjoying this sighting i just have to quickly get onto the radio Animal is on Bugaluto North, uh, one station here, still static up in the tree. There we go. I've just explained. Unfortunately, whoever it was wasn't listening. And I'm going to have to do it again, I think. Go again. Our radios really don't pick up a great deal of information. Right. For those of you who don't know, we are connected to the other reserves, and I use the term connected in a very loose way. 
by a two-way radio that's supposed to help us find uh, animals and go to each other's sightings, which is great. It doesn't always work, though. But it works well enough. That's what got us here, to Nsumi the Lepides. Quintessential leopard shot. And you can see what I was talking about there regarding the difficulties of trying to expose a shot like this for the cameraman, in this case, Mpo. And the background is just very bright. And in order to see the leopard at all, well, you've got to ex overexpose the background. And it amazes me that our eyes and our brains are able to do all of that completely automatically. And in fact, our eyes are able to create a much better picture than any camera can. Because we immediately, it's something to do with the processing of the image in our brains. We will immediately dull the background out and pull the shadows out of the foreground, which you can only do with fairly sophisticated software if you are recording an image like this, and our brains just do it automatically. Which is very clever, is it not? It is. Good. <laughs> Lovely kind of bird song around us as the rain dissipates. Mostly rattling cisticulas. Yes, Waikisha, leopard whiskers, I think, are longer than lion whiskers. And that is probably especially the case for, at least not especially the case, but leopard whiskers are not all the same length, nor are they the same style. And if you look at Kara, who we were watching yesterday, she's got very long, very straight whiskers that don't spread vertically a huge amount, so they kind of all go out horizontally. Where someone like Kalamba has got very long whiskers that go in a great spray on both sides of her face. So they're quite variable, and they're definitely longer and more pronounced than lion whiskers. By some margin, actually. Lions don't have particularly attractive whiskers. Where some leopards have got really Quite astounding sets of whiskers. I think I wanted to say a little bit more about this leopard's lineage, which I shall. Getting you wondering if leopards will ever fight with lions. Only the stupidest leopards fight with lions, and they don't normally survive to tell the tale. Uh, they're either desperate, i.e. they've been caught, unawares, or they are old and unable to escape, or they're stupid. Lions, remember, Betty, are much, much bigger than leopards. Lioness is probably about three times the mass of Nsumi, and certainly often at least one and a half to two times the mass of a male leopard. And so, you know, it's only a, a crazy leopard would take on a lion. There's that horrible footage, I think it came from Mala Mala, of a very old male lion, male leopard, being cornered by a pride of lions. And they, sadly, they kill him. But really, you can see the size difference there. And, you know, leopard's got no chance and they will often escape any interaction with lions by climbing a tree. So no, no leopard willingly tangles with a lion. Lions are the undispute, indisputably dominant predator out here. They're big, they're in groups. You know, nothing is going to bully them unless it's a massive, massive group of hyenas.
Mm, a bit of birding. Who doesn't like birding? I'm a big fan. It's not often we get to see these guys sitting so calmly and quietly. Not flying off. The European bee eater. Arriving here as early as October. And leaving as early as March, but generally in April, depending on the food resources. Obviously, they feed on flying insects. All right, uh, we're at uh, Trials Dam. Of course, we've got Del Dewey. He's uh, just uh, having a little bit of fun here, as you can see. Uh, that's a hippo that's in the water. And he's just looking like uh, he's quite active this morning because it's not so hot at all. And uh, it's overcast, so I think he is definitely enjoying this cool weather. Mm, I heard a, I heard an elephant there. Just listening out. I just heard elephants, just like the typical of that rumble. But uh, Dewey, did you hear that? Hmm? Did you hear those elephants coming down maybe towards the, the, the dam? I would be very happy to see some elephants. Or maybe, what's he, where is he going now? He's going to the, the side now. Are you going to come out for us? That's, a, that's his like typical his, his spot. So every time we do come to Trias Dam, we always find Dewey. So uh, resting exactly where he is now. I think that's his like his favorite spot. It's like the dewy corner, the naughty corner. But yes, as you know, it is back to school. It is our fourth day back to school. So of course our first hour on our sunset drive. We will have we will be joined by a few schools around the world and we will be answering all the amazing questions that the kids have got for us and um, I'm sure it's going to be once again a very exciting back to school afternoon so yes definitely we'll be waiting for that and that is between the 23rd of uh, January of course that's three days ago four days ago until the 27th of Jan back to school is cool hey Dewey and uh, definitely he has found his spot Maybe I think why he chooses that spot every single time, it might be nice and shallow, it might be just the perfect uh, depth for him to actually kind of rest his feet and maybe like kind of kneel down where he is now and uh, you know, pretty much put his half of his body underwater or at least about three quarters of his body in the water. But he doesn't have to worry too much on a day like this because there is no sun for now. So I think being out in the open and for his skin to be exposed to the sun it is perfectly fine Lionel, good morning I wonder how long can uh, Dewey hold his breath underwater well Lionel I will definitely try and get hold of Dewey and see if he can do that for us but uh, I know in general they say it's usually six, seven minutes that a hippo can really hold its breath when it goes underwater. 
that's what they say, six, seven minutes. But, I mean, you know, it's difficult to say if a hippo has to really, really hold its breath. Like, you know, for yourself, if you have to go underwater, you will kind of <gasps> go under and then you can really hold your breath for much longer. But if you just go <laughs> and go underwater, you'll, you know, you won't be able to hold your breath as long. So to really kind of get that exact time of a hippo holding its breath for, uh, underwater, it's going to be very difficult. But they say six, seven minutes. I always say that's like, well, <laughs> how, how, how did the hippo know that it had to hold its breath for as long as possible to get the right time? But yeah, that's what they say. Maybe Dewey will demonstrate for us one day, one day and show us how long he can hold his breath for. Yeah, but for now, I think he's just relaxing. I did have his tracks once again coming from the south, so it seems like Dewey likes going south at night time. Maybe there's some nice grass species that's a little bit further south, nice, very palatable grasses that he likes, and then he'll come back all the way north again. And he goes all the way to Gauri Main into Little Gauri as well, so it just shows you the hippos can really move great distances at night time if they have to look for nice grazing areas. Of course, hippos just eat grass, so and. Um, so sometimes they can really move greatest. And they say sometimes 20, 25 k's, 30 kilometers if they have to. Oh, but kind of uh, selective grazers. Or moving to other watering holes. And you know Dewey loves to go over towards Gauri Dam. And then Gauri Dam is about a kilometer from here. Not too far for him. I'm just hoping that these elephants will come down because I did hear those rumbles. Definitely a communication of elephants that was maybe on a savage track a little bit further in, towards the inflow of Trials Dam. Listening out to him. A couple of impal impalas as well, so just like relaxing impalas, but you can just see it's, it's a very cool day. So, of course, animals aren't too stressed at the moment. You saw those lions, they are fast asleep. They weren't moving much, so I think these impalas feel just as relaxed uh, for the morning with this kind of weather. But, yeah, while we are going to, well, let's, well, I'm going to hope that these elephants do come down. And while we do wait here, let's head over to James. remembered actually that I met this cat for the first time last year on one of my wild earth stints and she was much smaller than this which tends to happen when animals are young and I met her uh, lying eye level on a log and I took some photographs of her which I was quite pleased with so I've actually met her twice Tsumi the leopardess. The sun came out a little bit, it gave a bit of a shine on her, and then it went away again, which is a bit sad. And she is young, she was only born in June 2021, which makes her 18 months old. And so she, that's a young leopard, still in her mum's territory. She'll probably be looking to expand into her own territory sometime in the not too distant future. But she's by no means old enough to be dominating an area. Probably some time also before she has her first litter of babies. I do apologize for the presence of that incredibly irritating branch that is really showing an insufferable desire to be on screen. It is photobombing everything and uh, it thinks it's the main attraction, but it isn't. 
and doesn't understand that we really have no desire to look at a scraggly torchwood branch rather than the leopard. Well, now you see, I guess it is, Nolene. Let's talk about camouflage briefly. You say it's amazing how she can camouflage in that tree. Yeah, you're right. You know, that, that dappled colour on her fur definitely does make her hidden or does camouflage her in that tree. And as many of you will have seen, um, Tristan Dix has recently been up at Lycipia meeting Giza, the black leopard there. Now, I met her last year, and she was only viewable at night. She wouldn't be seen during the day. And she was very relatively well hidden at night. And in the day, she sticks out like a sore thumb. And she would stick out like a sore thumb in a tree like this. And it's just a nice kind of example of how this coloration has maintained and the black coloration in leopards really has is such is such a rarity because I think it is much easier for a leopard to be this color than it is to be a black color. Now the other thing that we were discussing earlier or that Steve was discussing is the color blindness in these animals and and in most animals, in fact, out here, bar the primates and the birds. In the case of most of the mammals, they are blue, at least they are red colorblind, so they're blue-green colorblind. They can't see red. And I think that if you can't see any red, there's a bit of red pigment in her, in her spots and in the yellow of her body, it must be even harder to see. So if you're a blue-green colorblind um, impala or something like that, I think it would be even harder to see her with that camouflage and that color. Especially mixed in that in with that green tree. She is completely at peace. And maybe my assertion that they never really get that comfortable in trees is not entirely accurate. Join us from the 23rd to the 27th of January for a week of back-to-school special safaris tailored specifically towards our future conservationists. Our naturalists will exclusively be taking questions from schools across the globe. Tune in for some entertaining animal education to ease you back into the school year because fostering the upcoming generations of conservationists matters.
Hey, our elephants came down. So I thought that I heard some rumbling in the background. Of course, you had the inflow of uh, Trials Dam. And finally, well, Dewey's going crazy there. Finally, we've got the three elephants that's come down. Looked like mom, of course, uh, like a toddler and a calf. So, of course, it must be her two youngsters. One is around about maybe about eight years old. Other one, maybe three, three and a half. So, yes, nice to see the three of them coming through here. I thought there might be a, a bigger herd, but I don't see any, any other elephants. But it's nice just to see them coming down here for a drink. And a poor Dewey was lying and starting to rest exactly there where they were busy drinking at this point in time. He was in like having a bit of a, a morning snooze and then, of course, the female chased him off. So I don't think he's too happy. <laughs> Look at the one scratching leg. Oop, a little bit of an itch there. Oh, that is very cute. But yes, if you have missed anything on uh, this uh, morning's uh, sunrise safari, or if you want to pretty much catch up again on a fantastic sighting, there is definitely uh, our highlight reel that's uh, our best bits. So make sure that you do download the Wild Earth app to go and watch all the best bits on our sunrise safari. And definitely it was quite entertaining once again. It was all the cats were out to play this morning and uh, leopard, beautiful sexy one there in Pride Lens and had some lions in Madikwe and of course uh, James had Sumi and I had some Telemati breakaways so yes it was definitely like as Steve says not a Thursday but a fur day definitely a lot of uh, furry cats around but it's nice at least to end off with these beautiful elephants Always oh, amazing just to, oh, chasing and pulling parlors around there, bullying them. Zoe, I'm glad that you enjoyed the, the sunrise safari. I'm sure you, we enjoyed it just as much as you did. So it has been a fantastic morning with so many great sightings. And uh, what a way to end off our sunrise safari with uh, these elephants. Well, the little ones inside the little wallow. <laughs> what are you doing? Help me. I need to get out. <laughs> oh, I, when it comes to elephants and the youngsters, the calves, I think they are so entertaining. I can just sit and watch them all day because, you know, they are always full of antics and all that. So, yeah. But don't forget, please, to stay tuned for our Escape to Nature straight after our Sunrise Safari. And uh, definitely to see more amazing animals. But yes, once again, thank you so much for all the questions, comments that you have sent through to us this morning. It has been so entertaining. It has been so much fun. And I'm hoping that we could answer as many questions as possible. And uh, we will definitely, once again, we will see you on our sunset sorry this afternoon but yes from the wild earth team have a wonderful morning or afternoon or evening from wherever you are watching from <laughs>